Welcome back. You are watching Roundtable and we are with Professor Rajiv Vijay Singh, Secretary of the Ministry of Disaster Management and Human Rights. So in the second segment of Roundtable, we touch upon a very crucial aspect in the sense that it was about the statements released by Mr. Fonseca and actually the withdrawal of the letter of uh, Professor Vijay Singh when he replied to uh, Ms. Alston. So in that context, we actually asked him what his take was and what his stance was and why it, was, it actually happened. And also we touched upon the presidential elections and actually the Philip Alston's coming with the uh, Channel 4 video and Professor Vijay Singh's perspectives on Philip Alston, which was very interesting because he, he uh, he sees Philip Alston as a person who is also very much into sensationalism and who also drops, uh, who also sort of barks just at a statement and who also wants to sort of embarrass Sri Lanka. So he gave his interesting, very interesting analysis. Now, Professor, moving on to another aspect, I would also want to question you on the allegations of corruptions level at the government. So the, the talk of the town is that there's unprecedented corruption. So what are your opinions? on this? Well, I mean, the talk of the town was a good way of putting it. Columbo talks a lot. But I think what people forget, people have very short memories, is that there have always been enormous allegations against those in power. You know, President Kumaratunga suffered from massive allegations about things she was supposed to have done wrong. And of course, even the Vikramasinghe government had a lot of allegations made against it. Um, for instance, uh, the uh, one newspaper editor of, of a paper that's generally very pro UNP told me at one point, well, there are only three honest ministers in this government Ryan Vikramasinghe, Karuja Surya, and Karnasena Kodithoku. Now, I think that was a bit of an exaggeration. But then the Sunday leader, which was also very pro that government, launched a massive attack on Karuja Surya, saying how corrupt he was, which um, personally I think is absolute nonsense. Um, but you see what happens is people don't really look for evidence. On the other hand, I could also possibly understand, you know, when they said those three were honest, I realized that the election that followed, that of the three of them, Karnas Enakodja could put up no posters at all. And I think there's a mark that you know, he had no money. And he lost. Karuja Asuri didn't put up posters. But because of his personality and he was the leader of the list, he won. Of course, Ranil Vikram said he didn't need posters because the party paid for all his posters. So do you see what I'm also getting at? That there's a sense I think it's very important that the electoral system should be changed because it encourages a lot of corruption in, in a lot of uh, people for the simple reason that you need enormous amounts of money to fight elections. My, my father, whom you mentioned, had a lovely line, you know. In the early 80s, he had told J.R. J. Wadden, he said, Sir, you are making robbers out of barons. You know, Sir John, King John was supposed to have said, I'm making barons out of robbers. But my father's point to Jehan was the system of politics he had introduced was corrupting the politicians. You know, and I have always felt that if people had not had the experience of the Jawad in the government, they would not have had this tendency to think that politics is about making money. So I hope that that tradition can be changed. Um, having said that, I think one of the things you need to look at is, is there any evidence? And to me, there is no hard evidence. I'm sure there are allegations. I'm sure there are individuals on all sides. But I'll give you one example that I think is so important. In the 2002 to 3 period, I used to do some work at the Army and uh, Military Academy. We did their degree course. And almost universally, the officers there were deeply upset at what they thought was corruption in arms purchasers. This was the time when Tilak Marapana was the minister. I'm not for a moment saying he was responsible, but there was a general sense that procurement was gone haywire and there was no commitment to the forces. That completely vanished in the post-2005 period. There was a great sense of confidence that they were getting value for money and I think the results of the war showed that they did get value for money. You did actually have an army that was despite enormous difficulties and don't forget some European countries were trying to stop us getting weapons we got the right weapons to do the right job. And there is not a sense of, let's say, anxiety and anger that I could sense in 2002 and 2003 about defense procurement. There isn't what you had in the period before that, where officials had children involved in arms dealings. 
I don't know whether you're aware of this, but right through the 80s and the 90s, <coughs> people in very important bureaucratic positions unashamedly had children who were involved in arms procurement. Now, as I told you, this uh, war was won in a way that gave the army enormous confidence that they were getting the right things. And I think you'll find that a lot of the stories are unsubstantiatable. And unfortunately, the difference between now and perhaps all those allegations that were circulating in 2002 and 2003 about that government, that were circulating about poor Pre President Kumaratunga, is that the people who circulate stories are much more sophisticated now. But I think it would be important to just say, as we have said with human rights violations, produce evidence, produce a plausible allegation that must certainly be investigated. Right. And so also, are you saying that the, the, it's sort of like propaganda and the ways of rumors are being spread? Do you think, see that also as an aspect in the whole corruption talk that is going on? I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of that. As I said, it, it's happened all the time in the past. I'm sure a lot of that is happening now because we're not getting the concrete evidence. You see, we're in the old days when I was running the Peace Secretariat. I would check on human rights violations. I didn't need foreigners to tell me. I would look at Tamilnet every morning, or get my staff to, and say, what are the potential allegations? Can we have explanations for those? Because my assumption was Tamilnet was the worst possible scenario, that if anything bad had happened, it would be repeated. Similarly, I would say, uh, look at the leader, because that is the worst possible scenario. But if you look at its allegations of corruption, they've been flogging about two dead horses endlessly each time. And of course they've also, you know, in a sense changed their tune with recent developments. Some of the allegations they made earlier have now vanished. And Frederick is unashamed about saying, I have a particular political position, the leader made a decision. So I think there's a political agenda in a lot of these. And as I said, if you had concrete evidence, I think it should be investigated. Because obviously, I think, as I told you, there's a situation following the introduction of this mad electoral system where it's almost impossible for any individual to get elected without a lot of money. Now, some people make it legitimately, but I'm sure there are others who think, you know, we have to find other ways of doing it. But that tradition, the nasty tradition of the 80s electoral system, must change. Also, Professor, now about your Ministry of Disaster Management and Human Rights. What is the role of the Human Rights um, Ministry in the sense like what activities and what steps have been taken to improve the human rights record and what is the situation of human rights in Sri Lanka? Well, again, we, we're not an, um, an, uh, an organization with power. There's a Human Rights Commission which is independent. We had suggested having an MOU with them to help them, but they felt they wanted to be independent. But we do try to assist them in certain areas. We now have a joint program in which that ministry, our ministry, and the Ministry of uh, Child Development, Women's Empowerment is working on things. We've also done a lot of work with the police. In fact, from the time they were in the Peace Secretariat, I said some of these allegations can be dealt with by better uh, coordination. And of course, I was very pleased to find that a lot of senior policemen told me our problem is we don't have enough training. You know, the Army's human rights record is really remarkable. In the case of the police, there are a few lapses, but it's because of lapse of training and one of the and professional training. So when senior police told us, you know, we haven't had things like the detective course. You know, people say the police are not finding out who did the crimes. But if you have the professional training, it's difficult. You may make an effort and you don't find it. Now, I was delighted to find that the new IJP, almost as soon as he took office, had reinstituted the detective courses. He's also doing much more concerted training. Of course, in all fairness to the police, until this year, they had so many things to perform in a situation in which they were, you know, understaffed and overstretched, that they couldn't really concentrate on things like training and development. With the conclusion of terrorism, I think we have to move on training. We've already had a couple of discussions on this. And I have to say that the senior level of the police are very, very positive about moving on to better training, to better professionalism while recognizing that, of course, the ground situation for the last 20 years when you were fighting with terror meant that you couldn't do this. But I was really delighted. I mean, the, the, the new IGP said to us two things he had started before we even discussed it. Detective course, senior detective course, and strengthening women and children's deaths all over, and especially in the north, because there are lots of 
um, you know, single mothers and so on. Again, they're very sensitive when we're having discussion and talking about, you know, restricting things. The policemen themselves said we also need to work with the schools.